Welcome everyone to the Yasmin Muhammad podcast. Today, we have a couple of firsts. We have one guest named Rafat, who is the very first guest we've ever had from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So we're going to get to talk all about that community. We've never discussed it before. And she's also the first guest that I've ever had that has gone through my program at Free Hearts, Free Minds. So that's really exciting for me. Um, because my program, you know, my organization is my little baby and I'm really very proud of it. And I'm eager to share all of her experiences and everything that she's learned uh, with you. Okay, Afat, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy you're finally here. Um, so let's start off with asking you about the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So a lot of my listeners will be familiar with Sunni Muslims because that's the 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 kind of Muslim that I was. Um, they're probably familiar with Shia Muslims and the slight differences between Sunnis and Shias because I've had quite a few Iranians on the program. But we've never before had somebody who was Ahmadiyya Muslim. Now, first of all, is it Ahmadiyya or is it Ahmadi? Well, so the if you're going to say it with Muslim, if you're going to say it like as an adjective, it's Ahmadi Muslim. Um, but then it's like the Ahmadiyya movement, and then or you can uh, say Ahmadiyya. So there's a lot of variations to it, but I would say Ahmadi is probably the root word. Okay. I would get in trouble if I ever said Ahmadi Muslim. <laughs> My mm-hmm. mom would be like, they're just Ahmadiyya. They're their own thing. They're not Muslims. So that they're, right. that sort of like sets the stage. You know this already, of course, exactly. with how Sunnis react to anybody who is not like as perfect as they are. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me, <laughs> tell me about uh, your specific sect and, and how is it different from the mainstream Sunnis? So I would say um, the similarities are that they follow the five pillars and <laughs> Excuse me, and um, you know the Quran and the Hadith, but where it starts to the, the main difference is that they believe that the promised Messiah has come, and so they accepted this promised Messiah who came to Qadian, India, in the late 1800s, and so there's like additional teachings that they follow on top of the Quran and the Hadith. Um, it what's interesting and in how it showed up and how it was taught was that if something didn't sound great, like in the Quran or the Hadith, and if you're like, well, you know, Emmanuel don't believe that. We actually, this is our interpretation, or read this, um, you know, commentary. So you had a lot more things to try to make it um, more palatable. Um, mm. So I will say that out of all the sects that I know, it's the friendliest, <laughs> kindest. Yeah. You know, don't follow Sharia law, um, and a lot of things have been, you know, just made easier on life. You know, it's 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 their motto is love for all, hatred for none. So now if each and, and, you know, if each member actually practices that, that's on them, but that's supposed to be, you know, the, the tone that they set. So, you know, all the, the killings and unnecessary, like that's not, you know, part of it, which is great. So, you know, with that being said, the community is, you know, tight knit, they have an ongoing community. I think that's another difference because other Muslims, like I had so many friends growing up. And I thought, oh, great, you know, we're Muslim. We're going to be doing the same things together. You know, you guys going to go to Jalsa with me this year? And like, what? We don't have anything like that. Like, we don't have annual conventions. We don't have, you know, like they would go to the mosque and they would live their lives. And so it was still different because there's like um, a living community, almost like a, a government, you know, that's like, you know, they've got presidents, they've got vice presidents, they've got it on a national level, they've got it on an international level, they've got it on a local level. So it's very organized. And I mean, it, you know, it helps keep everybody together, learning the same things. Um, that's, that's also what makes it hard because everybody's really pretty nice. You know, like I grew up with like good folks, you know, my family is really great people, you know, they just, they, it's just what they follow. I just don't have those beliefs, but it's hard when you say you're going to leave this thing because you're leaving a lot. It's not just, oh, I see you at the mosque every once in a while. No, it's your entire life. Like when my mom passed away, the people that came and took care of everything, right? They took care of, you know, food for days, you know, all the funeral, like I didn't have to worry at all. And that's thanks to the community. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's tough, but, but that's to me, like some of the main differences that I know of. Now that sounds beautiful when you're living (laughs) in Tennessee. Um, But in Pakistan, where a lot of 
Ahmadiyya Muslims live. It doesn't matter how much you believe in peace and love if the people around you don't. And so that's, I think that's in, in Pakistan, unfortunate. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's to the extent that you can't even renew your passport unless you sign that you agree that Ahmadiyya aren't real Muslims. Exactly. Like there's a that's a that's a pretty serious hate that you have to make sure yeah. that people agree to this statement about freedom of beliefs right. before they can even get their passport. Otherwise you're not a citizen, you know, it's, it's insane. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, of course I still have family in Pakistan who, you know, they have the fear of persecution all the time, have family who fled because of it. And it's, it's really, really sad because again, you know, they are good people. Um, but because of that belief that they believe in a, basically a prophet after the last prophet, which Emma, these, say that Muhammad was the seal of like, there's a little change in the words, like the seal of the prophets, he, but the promise of Sai is not bringing a new law. He's a reformist. He's, you know, um, upholding, you know, how Islam should have always been. And so that's how they, you know, go about it. And look, I wasn't that great with my dean. So there's going to be others. <laughs> there's, people can do their own research and, you know, find out more, but this is just how, you know, I remembered it. Um, and, and yeah, because of that, of them saying that they're just considered non-Muslim. And I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because in a lot of ways they still follow, you know, the core principles of Islam. So yeah, I feel for them with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of the, the paradox that a lot of people find themselves in, um, which is why a lot of Muslim majority countries are like 90% and over Muslim and sometimes even Sunni Muslim, like Maldives, like you have to be a Sunni Muslim. You can't even be any other variation of Muslim or you're not, uh, you you don't get the the same. Well, I don't think you can even be a citizen there unless you're a Sunni Muslim. Yeah. And certain civil liberties, like you just lose them in countries like Jordan and stuff. If you're not practicing the religion that they deem that you should be practicing. So um even though Ahmadis themselves, I think it's great that you guys, well, not you guys, but your you past guys, I guess, your past community, your ex community. Um, I, I'm. It's great that they're so, um, I guess, peace loving and tolerant. But that that doesn't work when you're living in Muslim majority countries. It works well when you're in America, so that's good. But at the end of the day, for you, it was just a intellectual thing that it, there wasn't really um, anything within the community that made you feel like, I don't want to be a part of this. It was just the belief system was just something you disagreed with when that the, makes sense. Yeah, it was the beliefs. I mean, for, for me, you know, even as, as like sugarcoated as some of the teachings were, they were still not great, a great fit for me, especially because of the things I wasn't able to do because I was a female. Again, you know, growing up in Tennessee, like I had all, most of my friends were non-Muslim and able to do and wear whatever they want. And, you know, for me, everything was like, well, you know, you can't because you're a girl. Now your brothers could do this, but you can't because you're a girl because, you know, and just from a young age, um, just being told no all the time, like it started to make me, it was, it was like, you can't do this, but if you sacrifice it, God will reward you later. And it, that was always the answer. It's like, you know, God will be happy if you, you know, don't go out with your friends uh, late. And if you, you know, don't wear shorts and um, you don't do ballet and you don't do tennis, like God will reward you later for these things. And I got to the point where I realized that every time I said like, you know, oh, can I do this? And I got a no that stopped finding things that made me happy. Because mm -hmm. as soon as I did, someone would tell me no, and then I'd be forced to, you know, turn my back on it. And I, you describe this so well in your book. And I think until I read that, I didn't have words for it. But you said something like it turned your like internal compass around. Like, whereas I feel like as kids, we go towards what makes us happy, what makes us feel good, what feels loving, joyful, expansive. And then when you start to realize that, that's always a dead end that you got to go the other way just so people will stop telling you no. So they're like, Oh good. You're finally listening. Oh, you're, you know, so, so proud of you for turning that down. And that that's where you're getting your, you know, sense of security from. It's like, I got to turn away from everything that feels good. And 
I, I, I just appreciated reading that because I'm like, that makes sense. Because even now, I mean, I feel like I'm so fresh in this, you know, journey. A lot of your guests I know have been, um, you know, I guess living new lives for a lot longer, but like, even with like, my husband will be like, you know, you need to relax, like, you know, do something that that you like. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> why would you, why would you <laughs> say that? You know, it's, yeah. it's, like, I still have that knee jerk reaction or like a friend will be like, oh, we should go out to celebrate your birthday. You know, what do you like to do? And I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and yeah. so it's just this, this healing thing. So for me, it was just even as nice as it was, it was just still crushing to my soul in, you know, just a very basic way. Yeah. Yeah. I read the first chapter of your book that you have online because I know you've started writing it and I can't wait to read the rest of it. Yeah. Um, but in that first chapter, you talked about the hijab, which I didn't even realize actually was such a strict thing in the Ahmadiyya community. Well, again, it's like one of those you don't have to do it, but it would be really good if you do it. And when are you going to do it? And, you know, you probably won't get married if you're not doing it and mm. go visit. Um, so the other thing, going back to the end of the community, in addition to having the Promised Messiah, they have like a living Khalifa. I don't know if you know about that. It's like successor, right? So they have a, a current Khalifa who lives in London. And I remember, you know, having a meeting with him, which is like a huge deal to get a meeting with him. And, you know, there was like an announcement, like, you know, Hazur will know if you're only wearing hijab just for him. So, you know, so it's like, so, cause of course you're going to go and you're going to put on hijab and you're going to take your picture and you're going to look down and you're going to act like, you know, but he knows that when you leave, if you're not really wearing it, he can tell. And I was like, Oh God, <laughs> I was like, he's got to know. So yeah, it's not forced, but it's, you mm-hmm. highly recommend it. <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know how to really explain that. I mean, there are no, I, a yeah. full of people who maybe don't, but of course everybody still wears it to the mosque because, you know, but maybe you'll see them out not wearing it, but it's, it's rare. It's, it's kind of expected. Like if you want to, mm-hmm. especially if you want to hold like a position in the mosque, you have to do hijab, um, you know, cause they have, like I was saying, like, you know, president, vice president, all these secretary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, So all those ways of saying, you're not really good enough unless you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this organizational structure that you're describing, is that in like in every country, like this, this guru cult leader guy that lives in London, is he leading all the Ahmadiyya all over the whole world? Yes. So so that's home base. That's home base. So he used to live in Pakistan, but because of the persecution, obviously he left, um, and yeah, so he gives, you know, the Friday sermon, people tune in from all over. Um, and it basically like kind of trickles down, you know, all the auxiliaries will eventually like report or, you know, like I said, that's, it's not my area. So I'm not that I'm not an expert in that, but just knowing no, that he's yeah. like the oversight. And it's oversight of like, cells like live different communities all over the world so in the states you'd have like your own little like somebody that reports to him or something mm. so yeah. when you left the community you said you had to do it very um like just officially so super yeah, different so than a Sunni muslim yeah right so that's what's also made it interesting was that um you know, I, I learned that there was a way because so when we're, when we're in the community, we have like a member number because when we pay our chanda, do you guys call it chanda? Like where you like, like 10%? Zakat. Money? Yeah. So, well, we have two. It's zakat is one, I think it's annually, but we have like every time you get paid, kind of like the Christians do when they tie. So anyway, oh, so you really? have, yeah, mm. so like, yeah, yeah. Gosh, these things are always so lucrative. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So you have um, a member number, basically. It's like when you were born, maybe. I, I never applied for one with my kids, so they don't have one. But anyways, so you have a member number. So basically, and I was also kind of tiring of the emails, like, you haven't paid your chanda in like five mm-hmm. years. <laughs> and, you know, why haven't you been? So I needed to make it official for a lot of reasons. One, to get off the lists, you know, to be like, I'm not part of this, so don't include me in it. And then also because the book was coming out and I know I want to be sharing about beliefs that I have that aren't in line with Islam and Madiyat or how I was raised. They're just my own personal beliefs that I want to share. And I didn't want to misconstrue anything like, hmm, well, she's Amadiyat. Amadiyat must believe this, you mm-hmm. know, or vice versa. Or 
that, you know, I could have flown under the radar and just try to do my thing. But if they had caught wind of that, I said something that wasn't in line with the Jamaat, they could um, like formally excommunicate me. I mean, if, if they cared, but it's just a thing mm-hmm. that could happen. So it was like, you know, it's better to quit than be fired. Right. Um, you know, and just kind of okay. like, draw the line. like, I don't, you know, my beliefs are separate. That's different. This is who I am now. And my beliefs, I feel like I can continue to change them <laughs> as I grow. Mm-hmm. Yep. Whereas, exactly. you know, where I, I don't want to be held to anything, especially, I mean, for a long time, especially as I was creating these new beliefs, like I wasn't letting go of the title Muslim. I was like, mm-hmm. I'm Muslim plus, you know, I also mm-hmm. believe in, you know, multiple things. Like I use tarot cards and, and, and my intuition and I believe I can create my reality. Um, but I realized that those things started being so much in contradiction to what it's like, how can I hold on to both? Like I, I tried because this is not comfortable. It's not easy. Otherwise, we, you know, I would have done it a long time ago. And so would have a hundred of others, but it, it just got to where I was like, I can't reconcile this anymore, you know. So how did that go for you? Officially sort of quitting the community, letting your, well, all the, everybody that's known you your whole life, your family, your parents, you know, your siblings. Tell me about that experience. It's been interesting because, um, so I'm an optimist, so I expected it to go really well. And it's a good thing I'm an optimist because I probably wouldn't have done it if, if I had known it was going to like take the toll that it has on me. I mean, it's only been a few months. I just, it was August. Yes. Like two months that I made the official notification, but I will say before that, why I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal is that piece you read where I took off the hijab. That was 2013. So I've been seeing my family without the hijab. I've been, you know, going, you know, being at their homes, you know, not partaking in, congregational prayers you know what I'm saying like I I felt like I was being very transparent on the outside about these are not my beliefs anymore but while trying to be respectful so I, I thought it was just like well this is just going to make it official and da, da, da. I thought everybody's gonna be like yeah you know we, we knew we saw this coming that's just kind of what I expected but I think um so I only told a few people so far because their reactions a couple of their reactions like stop me in my tracks and I was like crap I can't I can't keep doing this it, it would like knock me out for a day like just to read a, a mm-hmm. message would, like, knock me out and then I'm like I can't you know I gotta gotta live so so part of you know even sharing my story with you is gonna help me to be able to let other family members know because I can't call 20 30 people it's exhausting <laughs> right mm-hmm. and especially realizing that my one decision is affecting everybody in a different way. And I don't have control over that. You know, it's, it's weird because, you know, people who I thought would have a harder problem with it have been more like, I'm just so glad you found peace, you know, and just so accepting. And I'm like, yeah, I have this one friend who she's actually a missionary and I, I'm just so thankful for her because it, it, the irony, right? Like she's one of my closest friends, but she's a missionary. Um, and she was like, you know, I know this is sad to hear, but all that matters is that you have peace and happiness and I'm happy for you and your family. I'm like, wow. You know, so you can have that kind of reaction. You know, I feel like that that's, that's what I would have loved to have from everybody else, but it's not. And why other people react differently. Um, maybe you could speak to that. Like what goes on in their head when I say I'm making this decision, I feel like maybe they feel like their own faith is challenged I'm like why are you taking this so personally it's not about you you know so so yeah some of that has has been hard um it's mixed Mm -hmm. you know but like I thought I was gonna you know send the letter off let everybody know and live free and be like oh I feel so much better (laughs) it did not go that way Mm -hmm. I'm like wow this is really hard there's a reason I didn't do this (laughs) you know yeah yeah it's, it's been hard it is really hard are they sort of cutting you out or are they, okay, I'm well, that's good. So, I, I should have said that. I'm so grateful for that because I know most everybody, that's kind of what happens. They're like, well, you know, disown you. And that's, that goes again to me saying like my family is, they're really great people. You know, I think that it just, you know, they can just have a different belief system than me, but they love it. If it makes them happy to practice it, I'm genuinely happy for them. 
you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, thankfully nobody's disowning me now. You know, I will say, cause nobody, nobody on this call mostly knows who I am. Um, but my dad passed away when I was really young. And then my mom passed away um, 11 years ago. So oh, that, so you know, from, from a parent's point of view, like, thankfully, I think it would have been hard to tell like an, a really elderly person, like, Hey, you know, I'm mm -hmm. doing this. So, you know, you hate to say that kind of made it easier, but in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about their reaction. So I, I feel for people who do have to worry about, you know, how their parents and people that are the closest to them, you know, how they're going to react. So when they sent that letter off that, or when you sent the letter off and the community now knows like, okay, cancel her number. She's no longer part of this group. You didn't get any death threats. No. You guys aren't, no you really threat. aren't real Muslims. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. No death threats. But you know, I don't know how many people, because, okay, I had heard, I've been told that they can choose whether or not they want to announce it to, you know, like mm -hmm. I said, they have like, the, you know, at the chutbah, he, he could have announced it if they had cared enough to send it to him. I don't know. All I know that happened is I got a message back from um, the, the local president who I sent it to. And, um, you know, he just said, you know, of course, you started to hear that, but I mean, even he had a great response, you know, but he wishes me peace. Aww, and if, I, wow. if he can do anything for me that to, to reach out to him. Um, so that was great. Now, I don't think he let he said I wouldn't be contacted by anybody, but they have so many like email lists, like, you know, secretaries. And so I'm still getting some emails, um, which I don't fully mind because, you know, they were like it was like my community. Like, I want to know if somebody, you know, passed away or something. So. That kind of thing, I don't mind. But um, but yeah, no death threats. And That's I hope great. that continues. <laughs> I hope so too. That's wonderful. Um, well, that's really good. I mean, that's honestly best case scenario. That's all we all wish for. That's all we've ever wanted is just live and let live. Right. You know, if if you want to practice a different faith or if you don't want to practice any faiths at all, then that's your business. But to um to treat people so differently. Sometimes it's not even about faith. Sometimes it's even just about a piece of cloth, like even just the hijab, um, treating somebody as if they are entirely, you know, body and soul, a completely different person. Now you went from being a good person to being like a, a vicious, evil, terrible, you know, temptress whore from, mm -hmm. because of a piece of cloth, you know, right. and it's, it's like this crazy, well, how do you think that people are going to change that much over, over a piece of cloth? And it's the same kind of thing. Like I, when people decide that they don't want to be part of the religion that they were born into, um, all you can hope for, all you can wish for is that the other, that the people that you grew up with, that your family, that your, that your community can still love you for who you are and respect your decision. And that's it. But um, as you know, what happens with the, the mainstream Muslims, um, they just can't handle it. It's, it's a very large, but very tight knit cult. And you have to, you know, when you leave, it's like they take it as a personal insult. And now and the religion actually teaches that we should be executed. So it, right. it is very, very dangerous. Um, yeah. And that's why I started Free Hearts, Free Minds was because when I was going through that whole process, I was going through it alone. It is isolating. It is terrifying. Um, so, you know, Free Hearts, Free Minds was a way to rebuild that community, give people a safe space to be able to talk about things, to talk about the religion, to critically analyze it and discuss it in ways that you were never allowed to before. Um, criticize it, <laughs> you know, that was never allowed before. And, uh, and to sort of, yeah, give back that, that love that was lost when your closest friends and your family members and your siblings, and sometimes even your spouse can just say, I want nothing to do with you anymore. Mm. That's, you know, that gets you that get, that's really, really painful. That is, really but I'm glad cool. you never went through any of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm really glad. And that's why, you know, partly I feel, I don't want to say like unworthy or inferior to be in this conversation with you, you know, with, you know, because so many, like my story's not that bad. Like 
everybody's had it so much worse, you know, from their childhood and upbringing and how, you know, they practice Islam in their family and the backlash, like everything is so much worse. And I'm just grateful for that. I know because I'm in the U.S., you know, I'm I'm lucky on that accord. But like it's sometimes I feel like I'm I'm not as special as some of your No, I, mean, I felt yes. the same way, too. I always felt the same way. I felt really lucky that I was in Canada and, you know, I was able to get student loans and I was able to get myself out. You know, I couldn't do that if I was in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Afghanistan or like a 57 other countries. Um, so I always did feel really great. I also felt grateful that I was straight, to be perfectly honest, because imagine being a gay Muslim kid with the amount of self-hate that you'd have to overcome. Um, so yeah, there, we I'm an optimist like you. So there's always reasons to, to feel grateful. But at the end of the day, you're still going through trauma. You still went, you, you know, you're, you're going through um, a complete change of your identity, you know, of how you're seeing yourself and how others are seeing you. And so that's, you know, that's trauma, right? That's a difficult thing. Like you were, you were talking, um, you were saying like, you wouldn't even let go of the word Muslim for the longest time. Like I did that too for years. Cause it's like, it's weird. It's who you are, you know, it's, and so it takes a while to let go of it, even if you don't believe in any of it anymore. Yeah. But it's just, it feels like it's a, it, it takes a while to, to let go of that part of you. So tell me about how going through the program at Free Hearts, Free Minds, like, did you find that even though, like, like, did you find that it helped you to overcome the religious trauma? Definitely. I mean, it came at the perfect time, you know, just like your, your book did. And that's how I learned about it through listening to your book, which I love your narration. I'm like, oh, my God, your narration is amazing. Um, but so I learned about the program. Then I was like, this is what I need. Like, I didn't have any kind of like fears about joining. I was like, I, I felt like I was, right. you know, letting go of one thing. So I needed something to replace it. I just really wanted to talk to anybody who understood what I was going through, especially in the early days. Like, I feel like it was like, you know, when, when you're opening your eyes, you're like, wow, this whole new world, you know, this, yeah. this is so different from what I've known. And then you just want to like look for somebody and be like, can you believe this? Can you, can you believe I've been living in this world for so long? And this has been out for this whole time. I had no idea. Like, I just wanted to be like, ah! you know, and totally. so I was clinging to everything. I was going online. I was like, where can I find somebody? You know, and it was funny because even years ago when I first took off my hijab, like I would like very carefully go get on Facebook and look for like, did anybody post about being ex-Muslim or former Muslim? And I couldn't find anything. So mm. the fact that something was online, I was like, oh, it was like a treasure trove, you know? So for me, I just wanted to be able to speak and be like, wow, I was this person. And now I'm, you know, I'm learning how to be different and people to get that. Like, when when I first got on the call with the facilitator just to like vet me and I'm telling her just briefly about my story and she nodded her head versus being like that's right yeah right which is usually what I get even from therapists and stuff it's like well that's kind of weird you know but she was like yes and I was like oh, oh my god like even just that, gets it yeah right even just that was enough. And so you take that and you compound it by, you know, meeting on a regular basis, talking about these things that you always felt so guilty to have this different feeling or different belief. And um, for me, it, it it really helped me. I mean, there's so many aspects to it. I know there's, you know, how the facilitators helped like teach me about what was really happening to me, you know, this losing my identity, trying to have a new identity, you know, guiding me through that. But I think the biggest thing that helped from the um, teaching side was like, I would beat myself up about like, why is this so hard? You know, it's like, this is what I wanted. Why can't I just be like happy with it? Why is it stressing me out? And she was teaching about like the neuro pathways or the neurotransmitters, like how they've just, you know, it, it's like, it's going to take time. It's not mm -hmm. just a, you know, like, and that just, it helped me to not be so hard on myself and just realize, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's a process. And, and just that. Um, but then of course, the second part that I really wanted the most was just community, just mm -hmm. being able to talk to people. Um, you know, I wrote, I sent off the letter while we were having these group sessions and, you know, I let them know this is, 
you know, they're, they're like, you know, what, what's your goal for the week? And like, this is my goal before we meet, you know, I'm going to be doing this. And it's kind of like having any kind of accountability partner for, you know, any goal yeah. that, you know, cheer you on and, you know, you got this and, you know, we're here for you if you need to cry and that, I mean, you, you can't even quantify that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I love life. that so much. You know, as we were talking about that part about like going around and just like wanting to be excited with somebody, wanting somebody to get it, it reminds me of like, uh, this is going to sound crazy because I left Islam like decades ago um, and my husband and I've been married for like 18 years. And I still, when we're walking along hand in hand, like with my dog, <laughs> with my hair, like out with no hijab, I'll still be like, I'm so grateful. I'm so great. I'm so happy. Look at us. Look at us. <laughs> That's so me. <laughs> and I get to marry you and I get to wear whatever I want. And like, I'm still excited about this life. Like it just, it's not even, it's just like this constant gratitude. And I do that with my kids too. And they're like, yes, very exciting mom <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, yeah. but like you get it you know what I mean like yeah. and, and like we get it so like it is you as much as you have people in your life that you love and that love you back this is a such a is such an intimate overwhelming personal experience that doesn't matter how much you explain it to somebody if they haven't lived through it it's just so hard for them to understand it so yeah, having this community, having people to talk, having just like shorthand, I love like what you said about the facilitator nodding their head, like that still makes me happy that I can just say a part of a sentence and then the person gets it. They're like, yeah, and that, or they'll finish the sentence for me. And I'm like, oh my God, like, cause I was quiet for so long and didn't share anything with anybody for so long and just kept it inside of me. So, um, I only just started becoming public. So, and sharing mm -hmm. my story. Um, and so I, I still feel like a kind of like a new ex Muslim in that way, because it was just mm -hmm. kind of, I just hit it. It was just all inside. Um, that's, that's what's so interesting. Really is wonderful. like, because for me too, like, I felt like I was, you know, dropping the hijab is one thing, but there's still all this internal and, you know, like I still haven't had pork. I still haven't drank. You know, it wasn't even about that. Like I know some people are like, oh, oh I can't do all these kind of things. Yeah. yeah. I drank right away. That was the first <laughs> thing I did. <laughs> but like, like for me, it's just like this, just process of, I mean, really. And, you know, I never set out to like leave my religion. I didn't know that was really happening um, until I started, you know, after my mom passed away. And I really just looked at everything and was like okay something's not working you know like both my parents died young I'm I'm miserable all the time like something's not working and I was really deep into personal development um and I started like looking at everything and saying what if I didn't believe any of this stuff like what if I just let it all go and what would I intentionally pick back not not because someone told me this or I was raised like this or this is what we've always done or this is you know what's accepted in our family it's like, what if I just completely clean the slate and then picked up one by one and examined the belief? It takes a lot longer, but be like, you know, do I believe I'm a bad person if I wear this today? Do I believe that, you know, I mean, I, I don't, there's a million things. Do I believe I have control over my life or not? Or, you know, like all these things, I looked at it and if they felt good, I kept it. If they didn't feel good, I'm like, I'm going to let it go. And it was interesting because it made me slow down in life and be very intentional about everything kind of like you were saying like wow we get to do this like you look at everything like this is an opportunity for me to be more myself with every decision I make mm -hmm. you just start claiming yourself and reclaiming yourself and just feeling good that you made the decision based on you and sometimes it does look like how I was raised you know I do like to give charity we were taught to give charity I do like to visit with people when they're not feeling well you know like all those kind of things like I can still pick that up but I'm not tied to it because this is what we've always done. And I think it's more empowering to say, I chose this belief. It does. That's it right. was something my family did, but I choose it for my own reasons and because it makes me feel good. Um, 
And I'm I'm still in process because I haven't done everything there is to do in the world. And I still have the opportunity to measure each, you know, experience and say, is this something I want or not? And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just here for the ride. Like it's, it's so much yeah. more fun, especially with having like kids, you know, cause my kids are really young. Well, as I've been through this process, obviously, you know, they, they were younger and then now just at every stage, like it's like an experiment. Cause I don't have to tell them what well, that was one of the things I noticed. I couldn't tell them like even I couldn't teach them how to pray. I, I couldn't teach them the sure path because I'm like, I don't believe there's a wrong path. <laughs> I don't believe, you know, I, I can't teach you these things. So I never taught them the, that. And then I would just ask them like, well, what do you, what do you think? You know, what feels good to you? And it takes a lot longer to parent that way, mm-hmm. but it's so awesome because they yeah. teach me stuff all the time. And I'm yeah. like, it's, it's so much more like life to me is so it's like if it, I was living in this little bubble and doing these things and doing the best I could. And then the bubble falls away. I'm like, wow, this entire world <laughs> is available. And I, to me, it just feels like just so much more like possibilities for life and happiness and to make a difference, you know, just by you being yourself. It's exciting. So beautifully stated. Yeah, absolutely. When when you're when you grow up in a dogma like that that tells you this is right and this is wrong and this is how we were created and this is the world and this is how it ends and da da da. There's no room for mystery. There's no room for interest. There's no room for curiosity. You know. Um, so I, I totally get exactly what you're saying. I had that same feeling of just like, wow, it, it can be terrifying especially when you're used to having all the answers in one book and now suddenly you have to like figure it out. Um, but it, it's also so exciting and, and so beautiful and so invigorating. You get to, you know, exactly what you said, pick up every little brick of who you are and examine it. Like, do I want this to be a part of me or not? As opposed to, I have to do this or I have to say this because otherwise I'm going to burn in hell or otherwise this, that, or the other thing. But now yeah, those, you get those to, it is so much more empowering. Those are definitely like trigger words. Like, like I used to always be like, well, I can't do that. It'd be great to do that, but I can't do that because this, or I have to, I have to do this now because that's what, like that, just the, the energy of those words, like they're so limiting, right? It's like, there's, mm-hmm. there's no other option. Like I don't know. I just feel like we are just so much more than, than we even realize. And to keep smashing it down. It's like, no, you can't, no, you can't. Like, it's mm-hmm. just painful. Like it hurts. <laughs> to me, it just hurts me physically to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And you, the last thing you want to do is do that to your children. You want to let them grow and explore and become who they ever, they want to become. You don't want to keep them in a little tiny box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now as you embark on your healing journey, you have started to write your book. Um, And I know that that can be very cathartic and also very difficult for lots of different reasons. Um, Tell me how that process is going for you. Well, the book is really interesting because I started writing it, I mean, many years ago, it it was mainly to be like lessons for my kids because one day I was... I thought I was, I thought I was dying. Turned out, obviously didn't happen. Um, (laughs) Turned out it was like an anxiety attack. But while I was in it, I was like, man, you know, you can't die. You got to leave these lessons for your kids. Um, You know, you haven't taught them enough. And what, what I felt like was I hadn't taught them that they can be free and make their own choices. Um, You know, I was afraid that if I was going to pass away, that my family would step in and be like, oh, you know, here, let's, let's, you know, raise them like good little Muslim kids. And then, but that wouldn't have been how I was going to raise them. So I was going to, you know, start writing like, this is, these are the difficult things that happen in my life. This is what I learned from it. This is what I'd like to share with you if I'm not able to share with you. So that's kind of how it started. Um, And in addition, at that point, when I started writing, my mom had passed away, been a few years before um, I started writing and I knew I had not grieved during that time. So really like my intention for starting the book, it was to heal a lot of things that I knew needed healing that were on the forefront. So I didn't grieve because my kids were too young. And I was like, I was afraid if I took the time to grieve, I would like never get out of bed and I would never take care of my kids. And so I just like 
put it away, put it away, put it away. Um, but then when you think, what if I die? Then you're like, okay, forget that. We got to We got to speed this process up. So that's kind of how it happened. It was just me. I was like, okay, what do I want to share with my kids? And so I was kind of reflecting back on, you know, important parts of my life, things that um, like, I mean, you and I, it's, it's never going to be enough time for me to like really tell you about my whole life, but um, things, you know, my dad passed. So my mom did the best that she could, but she was worried about me because I was a girl. So she took me out of school repeatedly. She took me to India. Like there's a lot, mm. <laughs> there's a lot there. And then just, you know, what I learned from that, what that did to me, what kind of scars um, I ended up in an abusive relationship because of course I need to be punished because I was such a bad, bad person. So I found somebody to punish me. Like a, a lot happened. And I just wanted to be able to teach my kids all that. So what's interesting <laughs> It wasn't until, so I'm in my fourth draft. I think it wasn't until my third draft. So I had sent it off to my editor. And I guess I was saying things like, you know, it was hard for me that I was told I couldn't be these things I wanted to be. You know, I have a ballerina example. I want to do ballet, but I couldn't and stuff like that. So when I sent the book off to my editor, this you're going to get a kick out of this. She was like, she she was really harsh. One, she's she's not familiar with this kind of background, right? So she had some harsh things to say, but um, she was like, you need to be careful not to come across as if you're um, saying that Islam is wrong. Because when Ooh. I was saying like, I, yeah, buddy, I know you love that. And, and this is what's so funny. I was like, oh, really? You know, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I was just trying to say that this didn't work for me. And this, you know, I didn't want an arranged marriage and I didn't, um, you know, so, so. I was like, let me figure out how to word this properly then. So in the meanwhile, the memoir group I was in, which you've had this member on as a guest, her name is Deb. She was in my memoir group. This is how I learned about you. And she was like, I'm doing this interview um, about my experience in the cult, um, you know, with this woman who's an ex-Muslim. I'm like, what? Ex-Muslim. <laughs> I'm like really so then you know I looked you up and, I, and and this is what I was thinking this is so funny I, I love life life is so funny I was like I know I'll read her book and I'll figure out how to carefully talk about it ah! <laughs> so I don't that offend an error in judgment <laughs> it's like the exact opposite I was like I was like yeah I don't, I don't do careful yeah, I was like, you know, there must be a better way because I'm probably being like way too, you know, harsh. Like, what am I doing? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And I read that. I was like, oh, God. I was like, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I was like, let it out, girl. My, let my, it book out. Is, my book is not an anti Islam. Like, I didn't set out to write a book about I left my religion and this is, you know, this is why it's bad. That was not it. It's mine was about my journey to being my best self. And one of the things about my life is that I was Amity Muslim. It's so it's mm -hmm. in the book, but it's not the subject of the book. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. so it wasn't until I got to, you know, even reading um, your book. And then I was like, a lot of the pain that I felt and the self-loathing and the, the hatred and the depression, I was like, wow, you know, this person has had the same feelings. And I was left with the thought that I wasn't the problem all along. Mm -hmm. That's all I needed. It wasn't me. <laughs> and it, anyway, so thank you again. Um, but yeah, I was able to drop all the the hatred towards myself. Like, you know what? It's sorry. Um, so that's how the, 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 after reading your book, and then I think that's what gave me courage to be like, you know what you're actually saying? Like every time I reread it, I'm like, you're actually saying that you don't believe in this. You're trying to say you're this plus other things, but these beliefs don't jive. And it's, trying to say you're this person or be this way has caused you a lot of grief. So it's time to let it go. And that's yeah. kind of how, how I got here. Yeah. So I believe oh. writing your book will change your life. I think everybody should do it. You won't be the same person at the end. And I was told that, and I didn't know who I would be. And I, I mean, I'm definitely better, better and happier for it, but it's been hard. I mean, I, I went to therapy a couple of times, you know, digging up memories that I did not know um, existed. And I'm like, well, where'd that come from? Oh my God. You know, now I got to go to a therapist and <laughs> a lot of yeah. self-care, a lot of self-care. Um, yeah. 
you know, from, and it was all like well-intentioned. Like that's the other thing. It's like, I, you know, I don't want to come down hard on like my family and stuff because they were doing what they thought was best. You know, they, my, in, in my family, like they, like I said, loving people, they thought that they were going to help me get to heaven one day, mm-hmm. which is the ultimate goal. So, you know, that's what I'm probably trying to be more careful about that I don't want to come across as like blaming my mom. And so because she was a victim of the same, you know, thought exactly. process. Right? So exactly. I can't be mad. Like I'm not, I'm not mad. <laughs> yeah. Sad no, sometimes. you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and that, that is a very important point that she was the victim of this too. So she thought that this was what was best. Um, even though she it was, would, she would not say, at all, but yeah. she was like, I feel like she was on the border. Like for some reason, I feel like I've like kind of picked up the the torch from her because I feel like she was like in between. She'd be like, "Oh, if he should have been born to another mother," because she saw how much I wanted to do, and she felt bad that she had to tell me no, restrict like, you. Mm. Yeah, so I, you know, I feel I feel like she she would have if she had given herself the permission she would have made different decisions but it was just it's too much it's too hard but you have stopped it now the generational trauma and now for your kids are going to have a completely different life they're you're not saying no to them you're not restricting them and they're not going to be restricting their own children and you got to kind of think of it that way like you get to you know you had to go through all this but look what you can do now though, right? Yeah. Oh, it's it's so amazing to be able to teach um teach my kids, you know, from this point of view, not from my pain, but from my I'm like, look, you know, mommy's dealing with some things, but you know, we can talk about things. We don't have to do the same thing. Um, my son, I think he's 12 and he was wearing shorts one day, and I was like, you know, <laughs> when I was your age, I had to stop wearing <laughs> shorts and stuff. And he's like, why? I was like, because I had <laughs> so much. Because I had to cover my beauty. He's like, that's stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Like, from just from kids, right? I was like, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that we can just joke about that kind of thing. (laughs) But I always let them know, like, be grateful. Like, this is not, I mean, I probably overdo it, but I'm like, you know, I could never go to prom. But yeah, (laughs) I do that too. Oh, you can't help it. (laughs) Because part of you just you just want them to know this is a bit like be grateful, you know, and it's not that yeah. they're not, but, you know, part yeah. of like my younger self wants to kind of take part and be like, hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's true, and I'm and I, I do that over like on, on birthdays all the time. I'm always reminding my kids, like, you know, I never got to have a birthday. <laughs> Yeah. So, but it, 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 it really is coming from, like, I do honestly feel like every birthday that I plan for them heals me. So when yes. I say it, it's kind of like, I'm partaking in this birthday with you. Like I'm, I really am so grateful every time. Like I love watching them just like opening presents and hanging out with their friends and like doing birthday party stuff because it's like I get to be a part of it and so I bring it up kind of like in a place of gratitude but it's like I do it every single time yeah. <laughs> which yeah, I didn't no, even I'm, realize until I was like way. yes mom <laughs> I'm the same way but I think what's important with me especially with my daughter is to let her know like she doesn't have to take the weight of my past you know, I'm not trying to put it on her. I'm just letting her know that this moment is meaning a lot more to me than you might realize. And this yeah. is why. And I'm grateful that you're letting enjoy this moment with you because it, it is, yes. like you said, it's healing a part of me. To get that. And Absolutely. That's yeah, that's beautiful. So do you have any concerns about your book or any hopes for your book? I I definitely do have both. Um, my biggest concern which I'm realizing is again something I can't control is that as careful as I'm being as much thought and love that I'm putting into it and to every word and sentence that I can't control other people's interpretation of my words mm-hmm. they can read it I have the best intention and then it mixes with whatever is in their head their preconceived ideas their experiences you know connotations that they have that I don't have and they're like oh my god I can't believe you're saying this I'm like 
I didn't say this. And I mean, it, it doesn't even have to be bad, but even when I was in my memoir group and we were sharing scenes, this one member was like, wow, you know, this is what I got from it. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, I didn't say that at all, but I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> you know, so I, I can't prepare for every situation. So, you know, being misunderstood, I'm afraid of, but I also know it's coming because you're going to see what you want to see. You're going to understand what you want to understand or what you're c- capable of understanding. You know, nobody will fully get what I'm saying unless they had lived every minute of my life. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, you know, it's it's unfortunate in that I'll be misunderstood, but it's understandable and it's out of my control. So that I got to like, let that go. Um, like for instance, even the... Um, my cover, which is on the website that, and it says permission to let it all go. And it's got like the woman, it's a ballerina. My son looked at it. He's like, Oh, a ballerina. Do you talk about, you know, you wanting to do ballet in your book? Other people look at it and they're like, Oh my God, it looks like you're saying you're against all covering, you know, you're letting it all go. I'm like, mm. read the book. Cause you know, we were taught not to judge a book by its cover, but if you read the book, um, the stuff I'm talking about letting go is all the shoulds and the you can'ts and the we don't do this. And, you know, that's what I'm talking about letting go, um, letting it all go over. So, so yeah, that's, it's a fear, but I guess i am got to be ready for it because, you know, the second part of your question, my hope is someone will read it and say, oh, you know, I can relate. She went through similar things or I went through the same kind of thing and, there's another way I could choose to live my life. This doesn't have to be the end. You know, I I can have power over what I do and say, and I know it's for people in other countries. And I, you know, again, recognize the purpose that I have here in the West, but um, even that mental um, prison, you can still try to get yourself out of the mental prison and just know that there is another choice available to you. You know, there's, there's hope for, living a more, you know, authentic life. You don't have to follow everything you were ever told. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up now to the group and see if anybody has any, uh, oh, we've already got a hand that's raised. (laughs) Go ahead, hon. Unmute yourself. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I have to say, I have identified with almost everything you've said. Uh, I was raised fundamentalist Christian, which (laughs) Yasmin fully understands. Um, And I was shocked when Yasmin asked me to come on her (laughs) podcast (laughs) because I hadn't suffered the things that her previous guests had, but it was, it was wonderful. She's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I felt like I was raised in a religion of don'ts, can't do this, can't do that, can't go to the dead dance, can't go to the show, can't join the sorority, you know, everything was just don't, and it's just so many things you said, I, I just identified with so thoroughly, oh. and could now, many, many years later, um, uh, I facilitate a peer support group for people that have left the fundamentalist religion. And so many people, I mean, we have a lot of new people that just left. And then the people that that have been non-believers for years all say, oh, if only there'd been something like this when I was deconverting. Because Mm -hmm. it does, it, it, it makes a huge difference. And another thing, I, I live in Western Canada, uh, just outside of Calgary, Alberta. And there is a very strong uh, Ahmadi Muslim community here. Oh. And every year they have some kind of big presentation public about, you know, is there a God or something? I can't remember exactly. And they want representatives from a lot of different belief systems. And I belong to this atheist group now. And and three of my friends in the atheist group have spoken at different presentations representing atheism. Mm-hmm. So I'm quite familiar with, with the uh, Ahmadi Muslims. So I just, all the way through, I've been saying, 
I understand. I get it. Yes. That's so great. So, <clears throat> just thank you very, very much. I don't really have a question. I guess I shouldn't have jumped in. Oh, but I just want to say awesome. welcome to the free world. <laughs> right. Thank you so my, much. For my sort of theme, and Yasmin knows this, um, when I lost my faith, I found myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, too. Appreciate it. Lois should be one of the, uh, she should be your new editor. Right. <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> she gets, she gets it more than your yes. current editor. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, she doesn't know. I'm not using her anymore obviously okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that still annoys me because that that's that's still something that we're still trying to overcome you know the whole if people there's so much talk about like women of color authentic experiences blah 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 you know minority group pretending like there's this there's it, it looks as if they care about our stories but then when we like, you're just telling your own personal story and your own personal experience and you're being told, like, be careful right. that you don't offend. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't I, think they realize how cruel that is. Like they wouldn't do that to, to people. Like if you're, if you've left Catholicism and you're writing about it or Scientology or Mormonism or Hasidic Judaism or anything else, nobody's going to be like, how dare you speak your mind and share your personal experiences? Yeah, go ahead, Lois. You need to get a guy named Tom Restrelli on your show. He is, his book, he had the same problem with his book, um, Confessions of an Atheist Priest. And he did go through Catholic seminary and he is gay. And wow, what he went through. He, but again, his mm. book, it took him forever to find someone that would that would publish it because he was bringing down Catholicism. It's the same oh. same story. Oh, so that's terrible. Yeah, I just I sent, um, I sent my editor a, a link to your book when I first <laughs> when I was like I was like my book. Because I, I was like, actually, I said, you know, I was looking for a way to, you know, incorporate your your edits, and look what I found. <laughs> and then you're I like, had, be grateful. <laughs> look at exactly. this. <laughs> I had to put the subtitle, you know, because I know she she's a proud liberal, so I had to put the subtitle. It's like you might find this interesting. Um, so yeah, I left it at that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Yura. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I didn't want to disagree with anything, but I got to say, I, I don't agree that Jews, Jewish groups never shame people for leaving. There are Orthodox Jewish cults that are very hard to leave. Uh, and oh, no, no, sorry. However, yeah. however, it is not mainstream Judaism in this era that does that, whereas I think your point is that the mainstreams of Islam tend to do that. Oh, I'm not surprised when Muslims try to control us. Like, I'm not surprised that the Catholic people got angry at this priest and I wouldn't be surprised if Jewish people got angry at Hasidic Jewish people or ex Hasidic for speaking up. What I'm surprised at is the liberal open-minded yeah, left right. people. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to quarrel. Them policing us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, I, have a, that's I, I, have a I, I have a question. Uh, there are two things in this. There's God and there's faith. Uh, and I don't have, too much objection to God. I have a lot of objection to faith, as I understand that in the Christian world, uh, and to some extent in the Jewish world, we don't use that word faith as much, actually. Jews, there's this thing, the hand will teach the heart. It's what you're attached to. It's not quite so much an ideological faith, but you're supposed to affirm the Shema, that there's one God. Da, da, da. Um, what is the word for faith? What are the words for faith in Islam? Do they have the same connotations as in Christianity? Uh, and uh, not that I trust the Christian definition of it. St. Paul gave a definition, but I think it's nonsense. To me, the actual meaning every time I talk to a real Christian is that they're supposed to suppress their doubts and fanatically claim to know things that they in fact obviously don't know and can't know. Uh, so that, 
but they think, oh, no, no, that's not what faith means. Da, 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 da. Uh, what does faith that's mean the same to you? Islam. What, does it, what does it mean to you? Uh, what is the, what are the official meanings and the actual meanings in Islam? Do you want me to answer that? Or I... <laughs> <laughs> so in Islam, it's called Iman. And yeah, it's very quite, it's, it's very similar to what you described there. It's more the Christian way than the Jewish way. So it's about if you, if you have doubts, um, or if you have questions, then your Iman isn't strong enough. Your faith isn't strong enough. So your faith needs to override any brain activity. You need to just suppress it and um, do what you're told, believe what you're told, repeat the tropes that you're told. And that means you have strong faith. Yeah. Yeah. Is it similar in the Ahmadiyya community? Um, I think I think so. I mean, to, to an extent, we... In, well, in my family, we were able to question. Um, so, but that that's, again, it's, it's more like how my family was. Like my mom loved to, you know, let's look at this book and let's look at this. Well, you have a question about this? Let's look at this. And then at the end, she was like, I don't know. We would just, you know, keep going. <laughs> so, you know, in a way it's like doing it. Yeah. Saying like, you know, just, just trust that you're doing what's best and it'll all work out. You know, it's kind of, so it's kind of like that. It's just not as, um, it's not as cut and dry, like, don't question, just, just have faith and it all be fine. But it's, we, we had some questioning to get there, but still, it's still good to be able to have faith and be like, well, if you don't understand, have faith that one day it'll all make sense. And, you know, God will reward you. And, you know, after the day of judgment, you'll know, you know, so it's a little bit in, but that's more my personal experience. I don't, you know, everyone else probably had a different interpretation of when they were raised. Yeah. Uh, I should well, add that in, in the Jewish, there is uh, there's something similar to what you just described in the Ahmadiyya. It's the, the community, uh, it, that you're a part of the community. That's what you should believe. And on the Passover, there are the four questions and four sons are supposed to ask the questions. And the wicked child asks, what does all this mean to you? Uh, and that's wicked because the child didn't say to me or to us. You're supposed to identify with the community. So that makes the child wicked. By the way, I, I always got the question for the wicked son. Uh, <laughs> and yet at the same time, even though it's wicked, the question is supposed to be put in your mind. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, very different from how I was raised. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Sohail, but I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> We have another ex-member of the Ahmadiyya community. I haven't seen you in years. Last time we saw each other was at a conference in Ontario. And I felt I like was I was 2015. Yeah. Wow. That was, that was, wow. <laughs> really? Like, yeah. Almost 10 years yeah. ago. That's crazy. Um, but tell us about your experience growing up in the, in the Ahmadiyya community. You were in Canada. I'm in Canada. Um, yeah. So pretty much Toronto, um, you know, the bulk of my life. And um, there's a big community out here. And, um, or, you know, for, uh, well, let me actually just jump to one part that came up earlier about how, you know, there's no death threats per se. It's it's very peaceful on, on the surface. Um, and it's, it's part of the belief, you know, love for all, hatred for none. But the devil can be in the details because I think what that doesn't capture for a lot of us, and I'm sure if it felt the same, is that because you have a very loving family and, and a loving community, you kind of get love bombed. And while you don't fear getting your head chopped off if you leave, it's a different kind of fear. It's a fear of um, being perceived unreasonable by the people that you love. It's a fear of the people that you love being um sort of ostracized in the community because of mistakes that you've made, choices you've made. So you feel so immobilized. And a lot of people who haven't grown up in this sort of very insular environment can understand that, hey, you're in America or Canada. Why don't you just say you don't believe, you know? And there's so many layers of what's going on psychologically that makes it difficult. Um, in my own case, I... Um, went through different periods of belief and non-belief in my childhood and teenage years. But ultimately, I became 
um, as a teenager, a believer, and I went deep into it. And then after a couple of years, the theology didn't make sense. But at that time, nobody, um, I didn't know anybody who questioned. This is like the mid 90s. And so I wrote a book of questions thinking that elders in the community would be able to answer, but they just kind of ignored the book. Um, and that set me out to think, you know, their inability to answer was my answer. Um, but it took a long time for me without community, without platforms like this to, to, to come out and be public. Um, but once I, once I joined support communities, that gave me the, the strength to, um, then speak out publicly. Now it's been a long time since I've produce content. Most of the stuff I do is behind the scenes now, helping organize communities. Um, I'm on the leadership team of the ex-Muslims of Toronto, and we're constantly having new people come in. So this is one of the spinoff groups from EXMNA, which is spun off um, uh, the meetup groups. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is, is you know, my experience. And did you come out um, the same way Akhveth did? Like, did you write a letter and and have to come out like public, like take my member number away or whatever. Yeah, I did that more as insurance because I didn't want a, a narrative being spun. Oh, that guy wasn't really a good Muslim. So we we had to excommunicate him. I think it was important for me for optics, knowing later on that I was going to come out, that I resigned officially. Um, and, and then later I was writing under a pseudonym so that the attention wouldn't be on me and trying to uh, attack my character, but it would be on the arguments. And then when I was ready, I released like a two plus hour long video um, that took me way too long to put together explaining coming out. Um, and I like to say that I my strategy was to weaponize anti-gossip to spread the message and get people thinking uh, because everybody would be like, can you believe this guy? But meanwhile, there would be some teenager or somebody in their early 20s who's still open to thinking things through, and they would realize, oh, who is this person? Let me go look in, uh, you know, look into that. Um, so that was my hope. That's kind of your hope with your book, too, by Feth, right? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Sohail's material online is really what helped me to know, like I found his um, Reddit and page. And so I just like, I just opened it all up. And then um, it's it's funny. So, you know, he, he told, he has an article that tells you specifically, you know, how to go through these steps because no one talks about it because they don't want you to do it. Um, but what's really funny, really funny is that so I've actually known Sohil a really long time um, through my brother. He's one of my brother's good friends. And I did not realize it was him when I found his stuff online because I'm like, oh, this my brother friend lives in, you know, D.C. area. It's not him. So I'm communicating with him, not knowing it was him. And I'm like, oh, my God. So, yeah, it's wow. <laughs> even fun because the community is that. It's that small. That's what that wow. speaks to, is like how close knit it is. So even though you're in different countries, like you're down in the southern United States and he's on the east coast of Canada, but you still yeah. know yeah. each other. Wow. What was interesting is that when I saw her <laughs> message, a DM, I'm like, wait a minute, isn't that my friend's sister's name? And mm -hmm. I've never met her in person. That's kind of the, you know, the whole segregation mm -hmm. thing. You just kind of know of people. And then I thought, is this some kind of like somebody masquerading to like get me to say Trappy. something? Is is this some kind of trap or, you know, um, and I've had that experience a few times. Like when I first came out with my video, there's somebody who I knew who's super religious. I lost contact with them. And I thought, you know, I even asked them, I said, is this some kind of intervention? And they're like, no, 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 no. I've been waiting for you to say something for over 10 years. And so proud, you know, and you realize once you speak out, this is the value of what of being public, other people are able to find you, and um, they're able to start considering that they have a choice too. Um, so it was kind of interesting, you know. I had to vet back and forth a little bit with if it like, <laughs> is this for real? Um, and I, I I wouldn't have guessed it, and um, so here we are. Oh, <laughs> Literally, cool. yeah, it's pretty. Oh, cool. that's pretty cool. I didn't even. That's awesome. 
<laughs> so, um, Akhvat, I want to uh, give you the last word before we we uh, conclude here. So uh, tell us, you know, what are your, what is like some, some final thoughts that you have or some advice or something that you'd like to share with listeners? Uh, I think the biggest message I would like to share is um, for everyone to know that they can live a happy, aligned life and to constantly be seeking ways to know themselves and to be closer to their own selves and their own joy in whatever way that looks but they owe it to their their souls to do that that's beautiful and tell us where we can find you or where we can are you posting other chapters of your book online or just the just the first just the tantalizing right. first chapter yes for right now i've just got the one chapter because i'm trying to um so it's just um my website if it.com slash book i believe so that people can get on the wait list for it um I'm hoping to publish next year, but you know, we'll see because it just keeps changing. But that would be the best way because I'm not doing any coaching or anything while I'm doing this. So if you want to, you know, stay in contact and even help me with my launch team because I'm, you know, self publishing, uh, I would like to be able to, you know, have a strong launch. So if anyone, you know, reads it and wants to help me promote it, that would be very much appreciated. Um, because I just want, like I said, if I can reach people that say, wow, this really helped me, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, so that would be the best way. I'm on Instagram. Um, it's if at low to let, I do go on Instagram. So we will probably have to type all that out though. I'll, <laughs> I will share the link to your website and I will share the link to your, um, to your Instagram as well. And you know that I will most definitely promote your book when it's out. I will, I will be your cheerleader. Thank you. I that. And, you know, I just wanted to say about Free Hearts Free Minds, it, it might sound funny, but for those of us who are used to giving our chanda and our zakat and we don't know where to contribute, contribute to Free Hearts Free Minds so you can help other people change their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Course, yes, I mean. we are currently only able to help about 30 percent of the people that contact us. So it is uh you know, there are a lot of people out there looking for support, which is, which is good, you know, like, that's, that's very optimistic, especially when you consider that we're only in English. So there's, there's that, and then we can only help people that have reliable internet access and have privacy. Do you know what I mean? So we're only catching a small percentage of the free thinkers from the Muslim world already. Um, and still, we're, we're just, we can't keep up with our uh, with our wait list. So that's a that's a really positive thing to know. Like you're writing your book, so he'll um, doing his activism. Like each one of us, when we speak out, like he said, actually, it really does help to offer you know that ripple effect out into the world and help people to feel like I'm not alone and there's somebody else out there and I felt that way too and they've overcome and I can overcome. And, you know, there's, there's life um, after faith, you know? Yeah. I agree. So thank you again, Arfat. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for joining us. And Arfat, we all look forward to reading your book. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed Take it. Take care, everyone. Bye, Han.